So today we're going to be talking about artificial rhythms, the merger of music programming and machine learning. I tried to come up with a catchy title, and that was the best one that I could come up with. I did not ask ChatGPT or anyone else for it, by the way. Um, I came up with it myself. Um, OK, so the agenda for today, I'm going to give you a little bit of background about music, and um, then I'm going to tell you about music. Uh, so I'm going to give you the origins of it. I'm going to tell you about it. Then I'm going to give you some tools that you can use uh, for music generation and a lot of cool things uh, about music. Then I'm going to tell you what's new. Then we're going to do a demo. The recap was supposed to be in a second line, but it might be a demo recap, so we don't know. Um, OK, so allow me to introduce myself. My name is Ramon. Um, I'm originally from the Dominican Republic. I lived in the US for about 10 years. Then I moved to Australia. Um, I moved right before the bushfires in 2019. So I like to say to people that I had a very warm welcome to Australia. And um, from there, I moved to London. Now I live over there. Um, it's an amazing place. I'm really liking it. I've been there for four months. And I got there in right in the middle of the summer, so for the two weeks of sun that they get. So it was fantastic. Um, all right. So I have a little bit about my background. I have worked as a researcher in industry and academia. I worked for a company that does consumer behavior based in Kansas City. After that, I went uh, to work for a think tank in Washington, DC, loved it, became an educator, and continued doing research while I was in Australia. Um, I developed a data science bootcamp there. I worked as a researcher as, at the intersection of machine learning and uh, management sciences. That was a, that was a very, very fun uh, couple of years of my life. Uh, and I'm still having a lot of fun. I worked uh, as a freelancer for the last year, and now I joined Seldon. Seldon does machine learning infrastructure for the last end of the machine learning life cycle. Think about it whenever you have your model ready to go and you want to deploy it somewhere. Not only do you want to deploy it, but you also want to monitor it and also you want to explain the predictions that your model is making. So that's what we do. Uh, we specialize in uh, complex use cases such as uh, when you need to build pipelines that have the input of a machine learning model becomes, or the output of a machine learning model becomes the input to another, or you want to do A-B testing, uh, or you want to do canary deployments or shadow deployment. If you don't know what those words uh, mean, it doesn't matter. You can deploy your models with those, and it's quite cool. Um, all right, so uh, let's get started. Um, so this is my point of view on the landscape today of music programming and machine learning. Those circles, they can probably be in different places, and they might not be intersecting as uh, narrowly or as wide as they are here, but it's my point of view, it's my talk. Um, so hopefully I can amuse you a little bit. Um, so then let's jump into the music part, but without machine learning for a second before, so that, I, so that we can get an intuition as to what, um, what is that intersection that we talked about a second ago about between music, programming, and machine learning. So before we get started, we need to go back, and we need to go way back. And the only reason I wanted to add this slide here is because I really like Vox and all these um, uh, really amazing news outlets and uh, media companies. And they always start with a slide that says, let's go back. So I wanted to do it too. And, and I said, well, but how far back? So I just found a picture of a cave. And I said, well, this is far enough. Uh, but actually, it's, it's not that far off from, reali from reality. The first time, the first instance where we found uh, an example of music was 40, just about 40,000 years ago um, at a cave in Germany, uh, and they found a flute. And they understood that people were using it to create specific sounds, um, which is quite cool. This flute is still available in some sort of museum that I don't know where it's at. Uh, then, you know, we came to Mozart and or, uh, sorry, Beethoven. Uh, and then that became quite an um, interesting moment in time because music became something more of a, um, we're engaging with this, we're having a great time, we're um, playing some instruments, and, and, and that's it. And then, you know, we have a good time. But then now it's like, oh, this is something that we engage in, and we go and seek it. I believe he was one of the first people that uh, gave... Uh, one of the widest concerts, um, that, or one of the most attended concerts ever, in about 1700s, I think it was, but don't quote me on any of those days or any of that stuff. All I want to really do is to show you that um, the pivotal point of music was when we were able to start putting music uh, into paper and adding notes, because now we can actually take that 
uh, maybe not just yet, but now we can take what is in our heads, what we can play after we practice it a lot and put it somewhere where somebody else can copy it, somebody else can use it. And that, uh, hold that thought there. But really all of that stuff is just so that I could show you the transition that we have gone, uh, that we have gone through. And now we're, um, and then you come to the early 1900s and you get one of the most spectacular uh, pieces of music ever created. And this is one of my favorite sounds, uh, one of the best things I've ever heard in my entire life. Um, so I'm gonna play it for you um, just because it's a lot of fun. This guy is called uh, Billy Boy Paxton and he's one of the best musicians. One of my favorite genres is um, bluegrass banjo. And then, so we went all the way from making sounds with flutes to uh, in the early 1900s, making sounds that would sound like this. You would agree that that's pretty impressive, right? And that's not even the end of it. So I really, I highly recommend that you go and see it because then he starts singing and it gets very like, ah, the emotions hit you. Uh, but the point I show you that is because I want to create a distinction there. I just told you that a pivotal point in music was when we were able to put music into paper and then take it in. But at this point in time, in the early 1900s, the people that initiated this movement, they weren't able to put things into pen and paper uh, because they were, at that time, uh, they, they were still in slavery or they were part in, um, or they were not able to speak freely, they were not able to do things, but we still managed to capture those things. And now in today's day and age, all of those, the things that we were able to capture, the things that we were not able to capture, the things that are uh, written down in piece of paper, all of those can be combined and can be used to, to create transformative music with a combination of programming and uh, machine learning. And I'm gonna show you how in a little bit, but I just really wanted to play this. Uh, it's really nice. Um, all right, so, um, then other things that we now do with digital sounds is that, you know, there's a lot of DJs and, and there's a lot of people that can play that they don't have to be skilled at. Um, so, okay, so we have the being able, being skilled at playing an instrument, being skilled at programming, being skilled at creating machine learning models that can create music, but you can also be skilled at clicking things. And that's another cool one. Uh, all right, but how does music make it? into computers. Can anybody tell me, how does music make it into computers? Take a guess, share with me. MIDI. MIDI, yes, what's MIDI? It's a, it's a, it's a format for <laughs> interacting between. Yes, yes. Okay, how do we get to MIDI? Japan, right? Japan? <laughs> I, I, I've never been there, but I really wanna go there. Uh, okay, can, okay, let's, let's get some help. You're on the right track. How do we get, how does music make it into our computers? What am I doing right now? Microphones. Microphones, yes. So your voice is a stream. That stream to be able to become, so let's take it a step back. Um, sound, what is sound? What do, you, what do you guys think is sound? Waves. Waves, yeah. What is, what is that wave? Functions. Yes, yes, it's air pressure. So sound is air pressure. When I'm talking, there's like little waves. Imagine little waves coming out of my mouth. So those waves can be translated via a mathematical function and be put into a microphone, and then it becomes digital audio. The digital audio becomes uh, a string of numbers, and I'm gonna show you exactly how. So there's a sound, it's coming through somewhere, it's coming out of somewhere, and then sound, we just mentioned the sound equals pressure. So imagine we have two axes, and don't worry, there's not gonna be any math here. Uh, and then on one axis we have amplitude, on the other axis we have time. In the middle of that amplitude, we're gonna have something uh, that is called a, that's 
there's going to be the baseline, so it's going to be zero. Um, the top level is going to be a one. The lower level is going to be a minus one. Both of those two, to make it super confusing, are called max loudness. Um, and then we're going to start recording little notes in each one of those. And each one of those is going to have a little number. And then all of those numbers, at the end of it, we're going to call it a frequency. That frequency, that frequency is going to be the amount of notes taken at a specific second in time, or a milliseconds, and so on. So the wider it is, the more seconds we have, or the more milliseconds we have, the shorter it is, the more compressed the information is. But that doesn't really make sense yet, does it? So let's think about it in different ways. So now we have an array of numbers. If I want to compress that array of numbers and make it, so remember, I'm talking right now, my voice is being passed through the microphone, it's becoming a digital sound that you can hear through the, through the speakers. But I am speaking at a particular rate, and then um, it's getting transformed via that mathematical function and so on, and I am creating an array of numbers. That array of numbers has something called, uh, or can be, divided by something called hertz. And this is the frequency that we can hear. So when we divide a particular sampling rate via the array of numbers that make up my voice and the sound of my voice, we get minutes. Or we get seconds. Seconds of me speaking, seconds of a song, an instrument playing, minutes of a song. Usually songs are between anywhere between 2.45 minutes uh, and, I don't know, five minutes, seven minutes, and so on. So that's sound, and I don't want to take it uh, further than that because that's the right level of intuition for the rest, of, the rest of the talk. So that's audio and digital representation. So what are sound, audio, why are sound, audio, and music important? Uh, well, it allows us to, express, to communicate with other people. Uh, and also, uh, Andrew Huberman says it, uh, so I think that's important. He said that the, he pointed out in one of his recent, who here knows Andrew Huberman? Huberman? Two people, my God, my joke failed there. Uh, or my, my moment to shine there failed. Well, Andrew Huberman is a scientist from, uh, based in Stanford. He's a professor there. And he also has this amazing podcast on how to make science accessible to people. There was a fantastic podcast on how music can help with many different things. So um, I remember my flatmate, she had a really bad breakup. And she was listening to these depressing Adele songs every single day. And I'm like, that cannot help. <laughs> it can help. But it just so happens that it does. Um, when you are depressed, it, when you are depressed, if you listen to 15 mi minutes of sad music, it allows you to cope with the pain. Uh, they didn't say anything in the paper about longer than 15 minutes. So I think she overdid it. Uh, but um, gosh, if she was watching this or if she watches this later on. Uh, but anyways, there are scientific papers that actually say music has um, beneficial effects for health and learning and different things. So that's one of the reasons why music is important. The other reason uh, is it's a huge industry. The market, I think, is over, I don't know how many billions. You can add some zeros to it, and there's a, lot of, there's a lot of money moving. Imagine the pandemic. None of us could go out and enjoy a meal at a restaurant, but all of us could go to Spotify and listen to a song, or go to YouTube and watch a video of our favorite ar artist performing a cappella or something similar. Um, and also, um, I had a point on this slide and I forgot it, uh, but it was, <laughs> it's, it's an artistic expression, uh, and that was the point of it. Uh, I like Homer. Um, okay, so zoomed in still, we still have the music. Let's go back into the music programming and machine learning paradigm. So what about programming? What, what's up with, the, uh, with programming? Well, all of these tools that we use to listen to music, to record music, to enhance music, to perform live, all of them are written in different programming languages. Uh, a very, very popular one for the music industry to create uh, plugins and the like is C++, um, C Sharp, but also Python has come into the, um, into the field and actually quite strong. There's a few libraries that are unbelievable. One of my favorite ones is Pedalboard by Spotify. It allows you to read in music, um, add some incredible effects to it, and then export music to different, or save music in different formats. I have a demo uh, where I'm gonna sh uh, walk you through Pedalboard. And actually at the end of today, we're gonna, um, at the end of the talk, we're gonna see a demo on how to create microservices with one, a model that generates music from descriptions, two, a model that adds effects to your music. Um, then there's Pi Audio, Torch Audio, Basic Pitch creates MIDI representations. 
Um, then Librosa is another incredible library in Python that I really highly recommend it to add effects to music and do a lot of cool stuff um, in sound processing. Uh, then, um, also, there's an amazing example. Uh, so this is something that blew my mind. Um, I never thought that it was possible to see live coding of music, and then this guy just nailed it. Um, let me see if I can actually get this one to play. Maybe not. I might not be able to, but let me see. I'll leave it there for all of you to. Oh, it's such a good example. I have to play. Uh, let's see if I can get the name very quickly. PyCon, uh, programming music for performance, live coding. So this guy is typing, and as he's typing, So the fact that he's adding this stuff live as he's coding. So he's manipulating sound waves in the background and then adding stuff to the song. I mean, I mean think about a DJ playing and, and moving stuff um, and whatnot. This guy is doing kind of the same thing, but writing code at the same time. So that's some of the cool things that Python has come up with. Sadly, Foxdot, um, I think it has been inactive for a little bit, for about three, four years. Uh, but it's a really cool tool that if, you ever, if you're ever curious about what to do with music, uh, I highly encourage you to test it. All right, so we talked about programming, music. So what about the last bubble? And I made it bigger here, but it didn't have to uh, become a little bit bigger. It could be smaller, and, but it doesn't matter. Let's talk about machine learning. So um, who here has some experience with machine learning? OK, a lot of people. All right, so I'm glad I didn't put any slides on machine learning here. Uh, and this is all I did. So this is your, for those of you who don't, you have a pile of things. You put a bunch of data. You tell it what the label is, and then you let it do its thing. So that's machine learning. That's as far as I'm going to go, because there's a bunch of experts here that you can ask after the talk. Um, so then, but why is, why is machine learning important? Uh, better decision making. I put a star over there, because better is. Very questionable, um, depending on your use case. Faster decision making, we can agree on that one. Uh, whether it's good or bad, that's a different uh, that's a different thing. Content creation, which we're going to see today, automation, personalized experiences, privacy protection, and innovation. So those are cool things that we can all agree that machine learning provides us with today. Um, so so what's new? What what's what's the thing that we're talking about? Um, well, there's amazing things that we can do with machine learning, and one of them is adding effects to songs. I'm going to give so this one does play. Think about being able to create a model that specifically adds the effects you want to a song with very minimal tweaking. So this guy was breaking his fingers trying to type at the same time uh, as the song was coming up. And then this other guy just created a model and said, well, this is going to do it for me. Quite cool. So let me give you an example. So that's quite impressive. And the fact that this was done with a model that was trained, I think, very quickly, um, it, really, it really does bring up the point of, well, what else can we do with machine learning? What else? What is this out there? Um, what's possible? 
And that's all for some, that's what I'm hoping I can show you here. So this is another one. Uh, think about, now we talked about adding effects to music. Think about being able to, um, say you wanted to go to, you were one of the people that wanted to go to Taylor, to see Taylor Swift and you were not able to get your hands in, a, uh, in one of the tickets. And you wanted to, you really wanted to listen to a song that was a cappella by her. And then you couldn't do it. Well, kind of, you can kind of do it now. Say you have this. And then say, you could separate it with uh, machine learning. You can separate the, um, just the sound and then the thing that you were hoping to see a cappella. I mean, if this doesn't evoke the same emotion on you, uh, ah, gosh, we need to send you to Andrew Huberman. <laughs> so here's the a cappella version. Pretty impressive, isn't it? Pretty impressive that we can do that with a machine learning model and we can combine that with different things. Now, there also, there's also other tools called um, other models that are completely generating music from descriptions. This is, uh, Refusion is kind of like a combination of all of these ones, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna take you to the next level step by step. You don't really understand what this person is saying, but, but you know it rhymes, so it sounds cool. <laughs> It doesn't make any sense whatsoever, but it's cool. <laughs> this is what I thought when I first came to the US in 2010, and I, was, I, I landed in Oklahoma. I didn't speak that much English. And let me tell you, everything just sounded like nonsense to me. Um, and not because anything bad, it's because the English that you hear a little bit in school is kind of quite perfect. And then you get to Oklahoma, and everybody has a dip in their mouth. And you're like, oh, no. no, no, I'm too focused on what's happening here with like, as opposed to what's coming out of your mouth. So anyways, there's other, then the next level is these three particular models that really broke the industry this year of at the intersection of machine learning and, um, and music. And one of them is called Music Gen. It came out of Facebook. The other one is called Music LM. Refusion is the one that I just showed you a second ago and Muse AI. Um, it's another one that came out uh, quite some time ago, well, quite some time in the AI industry, it's probably about a year ago. So let me play you a couple of sounds and, and you be the judge of which one is best. A grand orchestral arrangement with thunderous percussion, epic brass fanfares, and soaring strings creating a cinematic atmosphere fit for the heroic battle. Quite nice. Nonsense. <laughs> Good track. So there's a lot of stuff happening. Let me play one more. Um, okay, so this is the original, the source of the melody, because one of the things that you can do, you can generate them with text, but you can also do conditional on some sort of music. So say, for example, you have a song, and then you wanted to extend it with a description. You wanted to describe something that you really like, and you wanted to use something that you really like, say Taylor Swift or anything else. So this is one song, and then here's the music gen example, 90s. So we took that song, that kind of like hip hop, rap, and then we added the description, 90s rock song with electric guitar and heavy drums. He did his best. But that's quite nice. So it's a, it's a trial and error. It's kind of like asking uh, Chad GPT, hey, what should I do uh, for the weekend? And then he comes with a bunch of stuff that doesn't exist in your city because he doesn't, have, he doesn't know that you, in which city you're at. Um, and it's kind of this one, like you have to really fine tune it. You have to, um, or not necessarily fine tune it, but you have to play with these prompts to get something that comes out that you really, really like. Um, and then another one that is incredible is cloning. Imagine that, so we went from adding audio effects 
to separating songs and creating this a cappella version, to generating songs from playing descriptions. Now imagine you can take the voice of your favorite artist and put it somewhere. Um, and, and how cool would that be that you can just come up with nonsense words and then have Drake sing it? It's not like it has not So that is, that sounds pretty much like Drake, right? And that is not him singing. Um, here's another one. Pretty impressive. Now, um, one more thing um, that you can also do, uh, or that you can also find, let me see. You can go as well, and not necessarily take artists, not take a song that was generated by someone, but you can also create specific sounds. Uh, say, for example, so when you think about the music industry, you might be only thinking about artists, uh, but also videos, taking music, uh, podcasts might have a soundtrack behind it, or um, games, video games have music in them. And some of this music is copyright music. Some of this music is created by someone specifically for, that, for the purpose of that game. Imagine that now, I, I don't want to take the job away from a lot of artists, but damn it, if you can just describe it, how cool is that? Um, so listen to, uh, let me play this one. That sounds like it could be, I don't know, in a cinematic scene going into somewhere. Uh, that could be part of a game, but it doesn't have to be. So we're now to the point that music might be indistinguishable from the real thing to some to some degree. Let me see if I'm still uh, text to song. Oh, I created I actually created a um, a song for today with Pi Data uh, in it. So So I said, this is my first time in Paideira. I had a lot of free food and free coffee. I hope there's more stuff like that next year or something like that is what I said. So, uh, so I'm glad I made you laugh on that one. That's the whole point of this thing. You might not remember the whole talk, but if you laugh, at least it was a good time. Um, OK, so what are the tools that we can use? Um, so Transformers, PyTorch, and Diffusers, they're um, kind of like taking over right now on music creation. Uh, and then we're going to see a couple of these tools here in a second. Uh, but those are pretty much the ones that are taken over. Um, so what's next? Uh, by the way, opinion alert. Uh, so it is, is it okay? So some of the questions that we might ask ourselves when we think about music generation are, um, is it okay to use the voice of an artist to train a model? That's gonna become more and more prevalent. There are artists that are quite okay with it and they wanna take a fee. One example is Grimes. Um, she has a, I think she calls it the AI twin. Don't quote me on that one. Um, but she's okay with it and taking royalty fees from people using her voice to generate music. But she's not, uh, she's not the majority of people. So if so, what about the royalty fees? Should we, if a person is making money out of a song that was created from uh, using a similar voice to a particular artist, should that artist get some royalty fees from that? So for debate. Um, can the artist, can an artist say, uh, hey, delete my voice or delete my, uh, delete me from your data set? Is that possible? Um, I believe there was a, there was a paper a couple of months ago that where with specific instructions to a model, you can always make it so that it doesn't produce or so that it doesn't use a particular artist if the artist was in the data set. So maybe methods like that are more uh, realistic than asking a company that spent a million dollars training a model to retrain it because you don't want to be in it or because they didn't ask you. Uh, and then also, is there some sort of middle ground in between like, can we have this amazing AI music and AI generated things? And can we also uh, have artists be happy about it? Can they use this to make 
music maybe faster, maybe better, maybe, uh, I don't know, more creative, and so on. OK, so time for a demo. Uh, this might be a little bit too dark. Uh, so. All right, so um, I have a couple of things that um, I created the other day for a workshop on uh, building machine learning microservices. And one of the, uh, the, the tool that I ended up creating, or one of the demos, there's about three or four demos. And you can find the talk, I, I believe it's going to be posted quite soon. It was at MLOps World. Um, but I'm going to show you the, uh, I'm going to show the app. Radio. And then we're going to walk through uh, the example, uh, a couple of examples. I believe I have about, is that our 45? I have about 10 minutes or so. So we got time to see it in action. So this is the app. We're going to take a description of a song. We can tweak the number of tokens. I'm going to explain what that is here in a second. Um, we have a couple of parameters that we can pass. We're going to get the song in here. And then we're going to be able to visualize the song. One thing is the waveform. You saw my awesome hand drawing earlier of a waveform. Um, then we're going to see how, do machine, how does a machine learning model understand sound? Because that's, that's one thing that we haven't mentioned. I'm going to mention it here in a second. Um, then we're going to pass it through an uh, audio effect, um, not model, but artifact or object that is also um, uh, served. And then lastly, we're going to pass it through, we're going to create a MIDI representation uh, for it. OK, so uh, back here. So we have, I mentioned, uh, the, the model that we were comparing a little bit ago was uh, MusicGen. And MusicGen, we compare MusicGen with MusicLM from Google. MusicGen is from Meta. They um, contributed to the Transformers library by Hogging Face. They contributed a class that can be used to call that model or different variations of that model, and that's called uh, music gen for conditional generation. If you have, um, who here has done um, any kind of deep learning whatsoever? A little bit? OK, we have a few people. Who here has used the Transformers library? OK, let's explain uh, for a second what's happening here. So here I have a, uh, the description of a song. And it is classic music with fast tempo, violin sounds, and a guitar solo ending. Uh, what is happening here? We have, usually when you have a model um, that is similar to a language model of sorts, or in particular a transformer, you're going to have a step that is called a tokenizer, or a step that takes in uh, your description or your input and generates a representation of it. Inside the model, that representation is going to be used to do some resampling uh, and to do some calculations and to do some stuff and then generate the thing that you want. Those representations in this instance are going to be um, something called um, an embedding or an, an input IDs. And then those input IDs map to certain values inside the network of the model. Then there's the other piece of transformers, which is called attention. So what is this attention thing? Um, if you think about a, um, a sentence, I really like um, coffee and bagels. If I take out the word like, and I just say, I really coffee and bagels, you might not be able to understand. So in the model, in the way in which it's trained, it's trained to detect what things you ought to pay attention in that sentence when it, once it gets split into the components that it needs to be split by. So it's going to know that, OK, really like is going to be part of it. It adds some context. It adds some meaning to it. And I am, I'm doing a lot of hand waving here, but I want you to get an intuition, not necessarily become a deep learning expert in this next five minutes that we have together. So I had a description. Um, and then the other thing is we talked about the sampling rate. So we have a sampling rate that is important for the generation of our model, or at least to explore the output of it. Remember that we have little points that represent a piece of sound, a piece of vibration. And when we compress all of those, we get something called amplitude. The amplitude or becomes, or that compression of all those numbers become a second. Or however we divide it, it's going to become hopefully a second. 
Um, so then we have the model. We pass in the inputs. If you've never seen these uh, two stars here, that means unpack the dictionary. So take every key value pair and put it as a parameter similar to this one here. So then we have do sampling. So it's going to be sampling from a distribution using those IDs, the, rep the representation of our um, description. Then the guidance scale, um, the higher the number, the closer it matches your description, the lower the number, the more creative it gets, but the less it matches your description. The maximum amount of tokens control the, um, the length of your song. So if a token in a word is every piece, uh, sorry, if a token in a sentence is every, piece, every word in that sentence, a token in sound is going to be, once it, once it becomes an image, imagine we chop an image and every single piece of that image, that little, those little patches, that's going to become a token. And that's, that is the representation that our model is seeing inside. So when we add more tokens, we might be adding different patches inside an image, but we might not be adding a complete second. So one, what I'm trying to say with this is one token doesn't map to one second. Many tokens do. So now we created a song. And um, we can see the shape of that song. It has about 222,080 values that are going to be divided by our sampling rate. And it's going to give us the second that that song um, is going to last. So now this is what we created. Quite nice, quite nice. What if we wanted to add some effect to it? I mentioned the library Librosa earlier, and there's a really nice effect called um, HPSS, which is the harmonic uh, something, something, something from, uh, from mathematics. And it distorts the sound, and it adds some effect to it. And let's see what that, what that sounds like. Nonsense. <laughs> what about the other one? So there's two. It gives you two um, two things to use, and one is the harmonic. Um, let's see that right here. Uh, it automates the waveline. Uh, harmonic and percussive components of an audio um, sample, and then so here's the harmonic one. It should sound nicer. So that does sound ni nicer than this. Kind of like more not in a room, kind of. OK, um, here we have Pedalboard. I mentioned that this is another the other library in Python that is quite nice to add effect for adding effects to a song. Um, I never thought I was going to play Toxic by Britney at a conference, but I am going to. <laughs> Let's add some effect to it. We cannot erase her voice, uh, and there's nothing wrong with her voice. Uh, but, we can add, but we can add some effect to it. Uh, let's see what that sounds like. I am not a music expert, but I know that the reverb adds a room size. So imagine if you wanted to make a song sound a little bit more like it's live. You will add a little bit of room effect, maybe. Or you will add something, you will add some sort of delay, because nobody can sing one-to-one -one perfectly a cappella or um, at a concert that they can when they are recording in a studio. There's a lot of things that happen in both of those. Again, I'm not an expert in any of these things, so uh, let's see what it sounds like. Kind of sounds a little bit louder, like a little bit more in a room. You can play with this. The, the idea is that you can play with these parameters and create something very, very cool. Um, and then also, uh, uh, I am Latino. I have to play something uh, Latin. So I have one here called, and I know we're coming out of time. So uh, Celia Juancito. Let's see if this sounds better than Toxic. I know it will, but you know. <laughs> So this is Celia Cruz from Cuba, amazing salsa and um, uh, samba singer. Um, and she's just fantastic. So let's see what that sounds like when we pass it through our distortion. Um, so our effects creator, generate. So it sounds a little bit, I don't know, like it's in a big room and so on. But now, to the, to the point of this talk, we can save that. We can do a bunch of stuff. Um, I mentioned earlier that you can pass one of these songs that we created, and then you can have it as the 
uh, condition on, upon your description. So the description that we created earlier, we can attach this new sample to it. I'm not gonna do it in the interest of time because I know we're running out of time. Um, but I wanna show you, how would you surf this model? So I already have the app up and running, but none of these components is, con is connected to a model. The reason why I, I said microservices is because we have, wanna have a separation of concerns. We might wanna have our app be developed by the front end developers who know about that stuff. We might want the back end to be developed by the back end developers who know about that stuff. And then we want ourselves, the machine learning engineers, the data scientists, the data professionals, to focus on the model and potentially making it useful, creating a microservice out of it. Why? I like to think um, the, your model, the model that you create, is only as useful as the value that it adds to your users. So with that in mind, Let's create a quick service, and we're gonna use one of the tools that at my company we developed, it's called ML Server. It's an open source tool, um, a wrapper around fast API and a bunch of other tools that allows you to serve asynchronously uh, many models. And one of the cool things that it does is that it also allows you to do batch, uh, batch prediction, adaptive batching. You can set up the um, many, you can specify many things that you want your server uh, to, to do before you put your server up and running. And how do you do this? Well, we have a couple of things from ML Server, the main class, um, the server, the settings, the model settings, and the model. We have the transformer model that we um, added a second ago, and then we have a couple of other things like the async I.O. Um, typing, uh, the async I.O. and the uh, type from the typing module. Then we're going to create a class. This is the most important piece, or one of the most important pieces. You create a class, and if you have never seen this recipe, if you are new to serving models, there's a bit of a recipe for serving models. One of the things, you want to do two things when you serve a model. You want to load it, you want to keep the weights there, or you want to keep your artifact loaded, and you don't want to have to reload it every time you're going to make a prediction. And then the second thing that you want to do is you want to have a predict function. When something comes in, an output goes out. That step is called inference. So we have our... Uh, two classes here, the processor and the conditional generation. We add them to the class, and then we have the inputs here. We pass it through the generate function, and we return a NumPy array. We need to know the sampling rate, which is why we have three sample rates down here. Now we're connecting the components. So um, we add that to our file. So notice that here I'm using a Jupyter Notebook um, magic where I created a file in a particular folder. And then in here, I added an A to attach, append that, this piece to that file. And then lastly, we need the function that is going to run our server. We have the settings. Here I have debug true. But I can also say, hey, if I'm using the, a particular port, I can say HTTP uh, port and say, actually, um, serve this thing in 7070 and so on. Um, you can also, it, it also accepts gRPC, but that's beyond um, here, right? Uh, beyond our time together. Um, lastly, you pass in those settings here. You tell, you give your model a particular name. This is going to be part of the URL that you're going to give your front end developers. Hey, this is where my model is served at. This is the URL that you're going to use to send requests to. These are the specifications of our model. Then we pass in uh, the implementation, which is the name of the class, and then we pass it through our server to start. If you've ever done asynchronous programming, um, async IO will start an event loop, and then it will run until completion when things come in. Um, OK, so now we have it. Now we can start our second server. So we have one for the front end, and then we're going to have one for, um, uh, for our model. Uh, I am awful at typing and speaking at the same time, if you didn't notice. Um, so then we call our program, our ML service, uh, .py, and then that's going to start a server. And if you've ever used FastAPI, you're going to notice that this looks quite similar. Uh, we're starting a server. This is the, um, the, uh, the route that we're going to use, and then this is the model being loaded there. So if we come back up here, and we describe, I describe something here. Uh, a fast bachata with violin sounds and a few notes from a saxophone. So I'm going to say create, create the music, and then it's going to start loading. As you can see here, it says 4.6, and it's counting the seconds. So this request is being sent to my server over here, which ideally, of course, 
Right now, I'm developing locally, but later on, this is going to be sitting on a server in AWS, GCP, or somewhere else. And then someone from your team is going to send a request to it, and it's going to attach that logic to your front end. So now you're going to make your model useful. Notice that down here, that was successful, um, that request. So let's see the song that we created. That was quite nice. And then if we want to visualize the, the waveform of that and see what does my audio look like, then we can visualize it with another function. And you might be wondering, where the heck is this function at remote? Where is in some of the files that I created in here? Um, so those two functions are in a directory called SRC plotting, and they are using matplotlib. So it's taking in the, the waveform, and it's, create, so it's looking at the latest file that I created. And then it's passing it in as a waveform, and it's creating a matplotlib figure. That's beyond the scope of this. Um, I wanted to show you the microservice aspect of this. And then the other one is the spectrogram. I mentioned, how does a machine learning model uh, understand what is happening, understand a piece of audio? Well, that piece of audio becomes a spectrogram, and it becomes an image. Once we have that image, we can chop it into pieces, and those pieces becomes, become the tokens. And then lastly, we want to add some effect to it, but I haven't served that model yet. And that's the last piece of this, uh, of this whole workshop. So um, I, have here a, um, I have here some requests that I can send to my model, but I'm going to skip them in the interest of time. And I'm going to create the last piece of the puzzle, the, um, not the visualizations, but the audio effect. So say, for example, um, earlier I walked through a couple of things from Pedalboard. And we talked about delay pitch and reverb and so on. So if we wanted to create a file, the other way to create this is by creating a .py file with only the model specification. So notice here that I am only adding a um, this files over here, my imports that I need, and then I'm adding the class that is going to have my pedalboard uh, effects. In the first one, I am adding a, a default one that I want my model to always take in. So every song that comes through, you're going to add this effect. And then for the other ones, I'm going to add a little bit more um, just in case. Because this one, the idea is that we could create more parameters and pass it to our function and then tell our developers in the front end, hey, these are the things that you can tweak. These are the things that you can allow our users to tweak. So we are adding this to our um, server, um, to our .py file. And then we need two more files to save. Uh, so the first way I show you how to serve ML server was via Python file. The second way is via the command line. This is the second way. So you have a name. I'm going to call it novice DJ because I'm nowhere near an expert. Um, I have the name of the file that I just created, audio mixer. And then I have the name of the class. That is the implementation. Then we have different ports here so that it doesn't clash with the one that we have running right now. So if I add this two to the same directory, I'm going to show you what the directory looks like. I have a, a directory called servers. And in this one, I have one called pedalboard. I have three files that I just created, the audio mixer.py, the model-settings.json, and the settings.json that you see here, that you see here, and that you see here. So there's about 25 lines of code. And if you become very frugal, you can actually make it less than that. Um, OK, so we created those. How do we serve it? Last bit. OK, so I'm going to do ML server start, and then I'm going to go directly to that directory that I was in, servers, pedalboard. And then I don't need to point to a single file. I only need to point to the directory that my model is at. Then I hit that, and then the same server start. And notice that it already loaded my model, novice DJ. And now we can come up here, and we can add some effect to the song that we created. So uh, for the record, let me play it again. Uh, the one. Oh, this reloaded. I'm going to create that song again with the same parameters, same, um, uh, same description. Let's see what it came up with this time. Not quite great. Uh, but the first, one, the first one was way better. We can visualize the other two things that we have. Um, there was an error there. Uh, OK. Doesn't matter. Now, let's update that song.
Okay, so here's the, the updated version. Oh, that was a very awful note to end on. Actually, so you know what? Uh, before we leave, because this is the ending, before we leave, I want to leave you on a good note, pun intended on that one, because uh, that one was awful. That was just awful. So, before we go, this is the last one that I'll show you. Actually, let's play this one. Okay, so that's the last note. And then one last message that I have, because I wanted to end it in a good note. Um, okay, key takeaway. Uh, if you want to get started with or advance your skills in programming and other data related, you know, insert your favorite buzzword here. Um, it doesn't have to be with financial data. It doesn't have to be with house prices data it, or other common use cases. Pick your favorite song and tweak it, update it, enhance it. And whatever you do, do not sell it without checking the copyright laws attached to it first. Thank you very much, everyone.